Today, we are talking about a highly requested case that just happened last month. It's a devastating and shocking case that left a small community in Georgia absolutely appalled. When we think of cases where children are harmed, we usually try to understand and wonder what the reason or catalyst could have been. Could it be a lower income family, maybe struggling with immense stressors like their financial situations? Or could drug addictions come into play? Usually we automatically think that there must be a reason. We try to justify it. We try to make sense of it. But oftentimes, none of those stressors are present. What about when the family is fairly wealthy or when it's a family that seems like they have it all together? Perfect example is Chris Watts. Well, buckle up guys, because this case is unfolding fast and we are going to cover everything we know so far today. I'm Annie Elise, this is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. Today's case unfolds in Griffin, a town nestled in the heart of Spalding County, Georgia. Situated within the Atlanta metropolitan area, Griffin boasts a population of a little over 23,000, this according to the 2020 census. Within this charming community resides the Shindley family. In 2013, Tyler and Krista Shindley got married and made the decision to settle down in the Griffin area, firmly establishing themselves within the community. As a faith-based Christian family, they have embraced their beliefs and have become pillars of support for others. In the beginning, their family unit consisted of two sons from Tyler's previous marriage, one of whom faced the challenges of autism, along with Krista's son from a previous relationship as well. Notably, the Shinleys had been foster parents over the years. After temporarily fostering three more children, Krista and Tyler adopted five biological siblings, twin boys and twin girls, who were all aged at around four years old at the time, and their six-year-old brother, all of whom also were homeschooled. The devout churchgoers not only prioritized their faith, but also ran a thriving spa franchise called True Rest. Their prosperous endeavors had enabled them to establish a very comfortable lifestyle, residing in a very large three-story suburban home worth more than $450,000. The home has five bedrooms and a pool. It is gorgeous, big enough for this family, and it seemed like they were the epitome of an American dream family, with no apparent cause for suspicion. However, everything changed on May 12, 2023, when a shocking revelation brought Tyler and Krista's deeply concealed secret into the light. On May 12, 2023, Kim Seigler, one of the neighbors of Krista and Tyler, was looking out the window when she saw a little boy walking barefoot. She knew that there were five children that resided in the home and noted that the children would never speak to anyone unless their parents were not around. Kim had seen this particular child previously, but it was always from a far distance. However, this time, she was able to get a good look at him. And this time, she noticed that the clothes that he was wearing were very baggy. Kim walked outside and asked the boy what was going on, and he stated that he was walking to Kroger to get some food. When the neighbor asked if he was okay, the boy stated that he was hungry, so she offered him some water and some crackers. When the boy stated that he was 10 years old, Kim was shocked because judging by his size, she thought that he was at most six years old. He was a 10-year-old boy and weighed only 36 pounds. And just to put that into perspective, an average 10-year-old boy should weigh between 50 to 90 pounds. My three-year-old son, who literally just turned four years old two days ago, weighs 38 pounds. So let that kind of level set for a moment. Not only was he severely underweight, but his skin was also discolored and his heart rate was extremely low. Kim quickly ushered the little boy into her garage and dialed 911. As she was doing that, Krista, the little boy's mother, raced out of her home and anxiously drove around the neighborhood looking for him. 
When police arrived, the thin, pale little boy begged the police not to make him go back to his home. Because of how frail he looked and his discoloration, the boy was transported to the hospital. In the hospital, he was treated for severe malnutrition, and it was also learned that he was suffering from a dental injury and disfiguration that had gone untreated. After their son was found, Tyler voluntarily went to the police department to speak with the officers, where he was arrested. And following that, Krista was also transported and arrested after her interview with detectives. The couple are now facing serious charges, including attempted homicide in the second degree, attempted malice murder, child cruelty, and false imprisonment. Disturbing court documents have revealed that Tyler and Krista stand accused of harming a child by allegedly permitting their four other children to witness and hear instances of both physical and mental attacks inflicted upon this young boy. Tonight, warrants revealed disturbing, you know, just terrible new details about the parents accused of trying to starve their 10-year-old to death. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Russ Spence. I'm Courtney Bryant. Tonight, that Griffin couple remains behind bars, charged with attempted murder. Well, Fox News' Christopher King obtained the arrest warrants for Tyler and Krista Shinley. He joins us now live outside the Spalding County Jail with more. Christopher? That's right, Russ and Courtney. That couple's behind bars here at the Spalding County Jail, and the arrest warrant is pretty horrifying. It reads the Shinleys lock their son in his room with no food, hot water, or even clothing. He's 10 years old. Neighbors say he looked closer to six. It's enough to break your heart. Matt Siegler is disturbed when he hears his next door neighbors are accused of trying to starve their young son to death. It's just not right for a parent to treat the kids like that. Fox 5 got copies of the arrest warrants against Tyler and Krista Shinley. According to the warrants, the couple intentionally withheld food and hot water and locked him in his room for extended periods of time with no lights or even clothes at their home in Griffin. It's just a terrible situation. Police say a neighbor found the boy wandering on Westminster Circle. He's 10 years old. He only weighed 36 pounds. We thought that he was six or seven. The warrants also read the couple was aware their son had dental injuries and disfiguration, but did not provide medical treatment. According to the warrants, the couple inflicted a against the boy with other children present. The boy was so badly malnourished, the DA said Tuesday, it's one of the worst cases of she has ever seen. It is my true belief that had, um, had he not gotten out of the home, that this case would be a very different one. Anybody that does that to a child or to anybody, uh, I hope they get to do punishment. According to arrest warrants issued for the couple, the Schindleys intentionally withheld food from the juvenile child for an extended period of time. They did not provide medical treatment and or intervention to the juvenile child and locked this juvenile child inside his bedroom, leaving the child alone in the residence for extended periods of time on multiple occasions, with no access to lights, food, clothing, or adult interaction and or assistance. The arrest warrant for false imprisonment also states that the child was locked in his bedroom with no access to food, lights, hot or warm running water, outside view, toilet paper, electronic communication, human interaction, adult supervision, or access to exit the juvenile victim's bedroom or residence for extended periods of time, and this was on multiple occasions. While details regarding the conditions of the other children have not been disclosed by authorities, it has been indicated that the 10-year-old boy was the sole victim of starvation. However, all of the children were still removed from their parents and placed in the custody of Georgia's Child Protective Services. On May 17th, the Spalding County officials announced the arrest of Tyler and Krista Shinley in a press conference. Hey there, um, I'm Investigator Spears. I'm with the City Griffin Police Department. I'm lead investigator on this case. I'm gonna give you a little bit of information that I have. This case still is active and ongoing, so information is limited. Um, on May 12th, uh, morning hours, officers responded to the 1700 block of Westminster Circle in reference to a lost child. Um, the call came from neighbors in the area who noticed the very small child walking down the street. They made contact with the child. 
He stated he was walking to the store to get some food. Um, the neighbors asked him if he was okay, and he stated that he was hungry. Um, officers arrived and spoke to the child. The child asked the officers to please not make him go back. Um, officers noted that the child seemed very small, um, very thin. His skin was discolored. Um, so the child was then transported to local hospital where he um, is was being treated and is being treated for malnutrition and a very low heart rate. Um, the child was discovered to be 10 years old, um, and at the time he was taken to the hospital, he only weighed 36 pounds. Um, this, like I said, this is really early in this case. Um, the investigation is active and ongoing. Um, however, I can let you know that the parents, Tyler and Krista Shinley, have been arrested and have been charged um, with the following charges. Um, attempted murder um, in the second, or homicide in the second degree, um, attempted malice murder, cruelty to children in the first degree, cruelty to cho children in the second degree, cruelty to children in the third degree, battery, simple battery, and false imprisonment. Good afternoon. Um, I understand and um, just briefly addressed in the beginning that there was some confusion as to the charges because of how they were listed on the sheriff's website. Um, it's an interesting note that in the state of Georgia, um, we don't have attempted murder under that statute. You have to charge the criminal attempt to commit a felony, that felony being murder. And I believe the intention is to release the warrants to you so you can see how that is charged. Um, the child is still alive. Um, when he reported to the hospital, as was briefly mentioned, his heart rate was extremely low. He was extremely malnourished, and they had to stabilize him here at Spalding. He has then been transferred to another hospital where he is receiving treatment. Is the child the intended murder victim? Yes. The state alleges in the warrants, and it is my office's decision to move forward on the criminal attempt for malice murder for starvation. The child was being starved to death is what we will argue. How long do you believe the child was deprived of food? I'm not, the child has not even been interviewed yet to get a firm timeline to just be candid. So I don't want to go into that specific. Um, but when he is released, we will have a full forensic interview with him and we'll be able to know more about those details. Did they Can you see how the child managed to get away? The child somehow escaped um, and that's, he was walking the street trying to get to Kroger to get food when some individuals that lived in the area found him and very good people that they are brought him in and got him some water and some crackers and reported it to police and we're very thankful to them. Um, what I will say is this case is disturbing. It's heartbreaking. I have tried many cases in my career and this child was simply put being starved to death. And it is tragic. Um, to give you some context, uh, I have a nine-year-old and she currently weighs 76 pounds. This 10-year-old little boy weighed 36. Robert, do you believe the doors were locked? Hang on, y'all. I'm so sorry. Let me go with you first and then Ms. Matthews, I'll go to you. And then Ms. Gunnels to you. Do you believe the doors were locked or how was the child being kept in the home? We do have evidence of confinement, but I don't want to go into too many details about that. But there is evidence to support the idea that the child was confined, yes. And I believe there is a warrant for false imprisonment. That would give you a little bit more detail on that. It's heartbreaking. I mean, as a mother, I can't comprehend it. But as a human being, it breaks your heart. We aren't releasing any photos of this child for obvious reasons. But I will tell you, the photos are absolutely horrible. And anyone with a human heart that looks at them should be shaken to their core. I certainly was. What condition was the home in? I mean, the, the home that uh, the home itself was was OK. I mean, but I don't want to get into too much detail about that. But the home itself was OK. But. There's a lot more to that that will come out as the case unfolds. Well, I'm wondering, is there like food rationing locks on the cabinets, anything like that? And I know y'all are wanting answers to these questions, but understand that not only is my role as district attorney, but because this is a case involving just very little talking about the specifics that I can give you.
Um, both parents uh, were, the father um, voluntarily came to the police department to talk to us once we um, had gotten notified of this incident. Um, he was arrested and taken into custody at the police department. Um, and the mother um, was transported as well to the police department. Once we interviewed her, she was arrested and taken into custody from the police department. And when was that? When was that? May, uh, May the 12th on Friday. The same day. Yes, ma'am. And what is the investigation? Are you looking to see if Powell was even allowed to happen? Was he not checking on this? I mean, it's hard to imagine how this could continue this long and nobody came forward. Uh, I agree with you. Um, we're looking into that, um, interviewing neighbors, that kind of thing, um, trying to find the, how, how that happened. Um, the children were homeschooled. What was the length of time of confinement? We're not sure at this time. We've heard this reporter say this was three or four years. Is that what you're going with? I'm not sure at this time. I can't answer that. And part of, um, I'll stand with her on this, part of it is because we still have to forensically interview these children to narrow down the timeline. So I understand that he has been, the child has been in a, in a hospital, so we haven't been able to forensically interview him yet. As soon as we do, we'll be able to answer mm -hmm. more of the timeline. Have the parents made any statements to explain what this is all about? Uh, we have spoken to the parents. We have interviewed them, but I can't discuss what they've disclosed at this time. Somebody asked a question. I'm sorry, I can't recall who it was about what's next. Um, a lot of paper for these for these investigators. A lot of work. A lot of interviews. Um, cases. We need pediatric records. We need school records. We need defects records. We need interviews with everybody that had any contact with this child. If there are other people that had contact with him. Um, and they are right now doing all of that work, and um, I appreciate them for what they for what they have done. It is my true belief that had um, had he not gotten out of the home, that this case would be a very different one. Sure. Well, anytime there's an allegation of a good question, um, we reach out to a facility that has trained people that interview children um, of of trauma. That be physical trauma, emotional trauma, um, and those forensic interviewers are specifically trained for this very thing. And so that's who we'll use in this case as well. On May 23rd, Tyler and Krista had a bond hearing where they appeared in front of the judge for the very first time, very briefly. However, due to not obtaining counsel yet, the judge postponed the bond hearing for three weeks to allow them time to do so, making the new hearing set for June 12th. All rise. Lawton County Superior Court is now in session. The Honorable Ben D. Tucker presiding. Good morning. You may be seated. Court calls the case of the state of Georgia versus Tyler Shinley and Krista Shinley. Case numbers 23 FAH 0838 and 23 FAH 0839. If you have a cell phone, please silence it now. If it goes off again in my courtroom, you're subject to being held in contempt. Is the state ready? Kate Leonard, on behalf of the state, we are, Your Honor. Mr. Shinley and Ms. Shinley, are you ready to proceed? I do not see that you're represented, and I've checked the court's file, and I do not see an entry of appearance. You're on for a statutory bond hearing this morning in front of me. Um, what are you doing, Mr. Shinley, to uh, gain representation in this case? I've uh, requested a power of attorney so that I can get uh, funds for a uh, private attorney. I have it ready to step up. Get the funds sent to uh, have a, uh, attorney present. Ms. Shinley, what are you doing to gain representation in your case, ma'am? The same thing. Okay. Do you wish to have this case continued so that you may get representation? Given the nature of the charges, it would probably be advisable, Mr. Ms. Shinley, to have representation. You have the absolute light, uh, right to represent yourself. However, um, it's not always advisable to do so. Uh, I will continue this matter until June 12th at 9 a.m., at which time I expect you to have representation and we'll go forward with this case. Any objections from the state? No, Your Honor, we defer to the court. Uh, any objections from you, Mr. Shin? No. Any objections from you, Mr. Shin? All right, the case will be continued until June 12th at 9 a.m. Court will take a brief recess to allow the camera and media crews to um, exit the court.
Griffin Superior Court Judge Ben Coker had to reschedule the bond hearing again to June 26, because the Shinleys still did not have legal representation. However, the judge stated that if they do not have attorneys by the June 26 hearing, then the proceedings will continue anyway. Melissa Waynette, Tyler's ex-wife, has come forward to shed light on the allegations involving her former husband. Although the 10-year-old boy who was reportedly mistreated is not her child, two of Melissa's children had been living with Tyler and Krista in Griffin up until recently. One of her boys managed to escape his father's house two years ago and found his mother Melissa through social media. Her other son, who is on the autism spectrum, was returned to her just two months ago. Melissa shared the circumstances surrounding her autistic son's return, stating that they simply called me one day and told me to pick him up at the airport that night, sending him with nothing. She was very confused on why they had decided to send him away. Melissa had previously reported the neglectful incidents that had occurred to her children while in Tyler's care. She clarified that during her marriage to him, Tyler did not show any signs of harming their children. In an interview, Melissa, who was talking about Tyler's behavior, stated that I do know that it's not the character of the person I was with, with him. Definitely not anything I saw when I was with him, but I do think that this has been a slow progression over many, many years. Melissa said that the son who returned to her two months ago has shown improvement since leaving Tyler and Krista's home. She claims that they withheld a lot of treatment that he probably needed, but now he is super happy, and even recently said he wished that he could forget the life he lived there. The 17-year-old biological son of Tyler, who was able to escape his father's grips, has also spoken on his experience in the home. He told interviewers, They were abusive to me, physically and mentally. It was getting worse and worse every day, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to run away. I couldn't leave my room. They would beat me very badly. They would tell me terrible stuff like you're a waste of space, a disappointment. You shouldn't even be alive. My dad would try to convince me that I wasn't his son. There were times that I tried asking for help, but they would say bad things about me, tell people I was a problem child, and, oh, he's just spouting off lies again. So nobody ever believed me. The 17-year-old stated that Krista and Tyler would lock him in his room for several days at a time, without food or water. On other occasions, they made him spend hours picking up rocks and even forced him to run boot camp-style laps in their neighborhood in the pouring rain. He stated that these punishments were not given to all of the kids, just himself, his autistic brother, and the 10-year-old boy. The twins, nor Krista's son, ever had to endure the punishments. He said that when he was young, the punishments were just holding dish soap in their mouths for extended periods of time. But as they got older, that no longer worked. So they upped the punishments to spanking with hands, then using belts, then wooden spoons, and then even whipped them with cords. The 17-year-old said, the worst I've had was a baseball bat. They would hit me in the sides, my back, anywhere that could be covered up with clothing. It became normal for me because it happened every day, even multiple times a day. I would come home from school wondering, what are they going to put on me today? How hard are they going to hit me today? He said that he was often left alone to babysit all of the kids while his parents worked long hours and obsessed over their status at Eagle Landings Baptist Church. They never allowed him to have a phone or a bank account either. And when he had a job at Dunkin' Donuts and Subway, he was forced to hand his paychecks over to Tyler and Krista. Although much of the alleged attacks described by the older son remained hidden from public view, some former neighbors came forward to corroborate certain incidents, like witnessing the boys engaging in activities that appeared to mimic military-style exercises, such as running in the rain and filling those buckets with rocks. In one incident, Tyler and Krista reportedly left the autistic child and the 10-year-old home alone while they went on a cruise when an EF3 tornado came barreling down their street only to barely miss their house. The storm was so significant that it ripped roofs off of nearby houses and uprooted giant trees in the neighborhood. Neighbors only realized that the boys were there when the older child came over to ask to use a phone to call his parents two to three days after the storm. 
They had been there in the home this entire time by themselves without power. In my opinion, the fact that the boys didn't seek help for days sends a clear message about the fear that was possibly instilled into them. Krista was believed to be a franchise owner of the Peachtree City True Rest Float Spa, while both she and her husband Tyler worked together in managing the spa. Previously, she worked at the McDonough location. Less than two weeks prior to the arrest, Krista made an appearance on a promo video for Mother's Day. Pretty ironic, considering what this so-called mother was doing outside of work hours. Following her arrest, the owners of True Rest Spas have publicly distanced themselves from Krista, expressing their shock regarding the charges that she's facing. In a Facebook post, the company wrote the following, As the owners of True Rest McDonough and Peachtree, we are shocked and horrified by the news about the Shindleys. True Rest is doing everything we can to protect the spa as a safe environment for our clients and our employees. This operations team has been replaced. The True Rest mission remains to provide an accessible flotation therapy experience for anyone struggling with pain, stress, and insomnia. They also released a video statement on May 19th discussing the change in operations team. Good evening. My name's Tim, and this is my partner, Sean. We are the owners of True Rest in McDonough and Peachtree City. We wanted to take a moment to address the community in light of recent events. We were unaware of the revelations surrounding our management team in McDonough and Peachtree until the news broke. Once it did, we've taken swift, decisive, and firm action. We have terminated any and all affiliations, partnerships, and financial relationship with the involved individuals. They are completely dissociated from both businesses. They would not be receiving any revenue, royalties, or payments going forward for either business. Additionally, we will be suspending all operations until May 30th. We are taking this time to grieve for the victims and thoroughly train new management. This comes as a shocking reminder to us that things aren't always what they seem. This reinforces our commitment to maintain the highest level of compassion, integrity, and respect for our clients, employees, and communities we serve. Thank you very much for your time. And more recently, just when we thought things couldn't get any more crazy, Krista's oldest biological son, 19-year-old Ethan Washburn, was also arrested in connection to this case. Ethan, who lives in Tennessee but was watching the home for his mother while she sat in jail, was charged with aggravated assault on a child for strangling the 10-year-old boy with his bare hands. Because Ethan lives out of state, it's unclear when the last time he saw his 10-year-old half-brother was or why he is being charged. But it's possible that the boy himself or one of the siblings told detectives about the incident. We first told you about this starvation case last month, but now Griffin police are saying the 10-year-old's stepbrother, his older stepbrother, is now charged with two counts of strangulation. According to police, he used his bare hands to choke his little brother. Fox 5 News has learned 20-year-old Ethan Washburn is now in jail. Griffin police have charged him with two counts of aggravated assault in connection with the heartbreaking abuse case involving his 10-year-old little brother. You may recall Ethan's mother, Krista, and stepfather, Tyler, were charged with attempted murder last month in the starvation case of their 10-year-old son. The Spalding County DA tells us neighbors found the child wandering here on Westminster Circle and hungry. They say he begged not to be taken back to his family's home. Many neighbors who did not want to reveal their identity say the abuse is unspeakable. I was very surprised to hear something like that happen in the neighborhood, especially um, seeing the kids. They were always just playing outside, so it seemed like a pretty normal family. I'm sad to hear. I didn't know they had another son that's involved, like a whole family that's pretty crazy to hear. We knocked on the Shinley's door last month and actually spoke to the third defendant. Ethan said he was just house sitting, but authorities have charged him with strangulation, saying he choked his 10 year old stepbrother. Uh, I'm, I'm not too close to the situation right now. I'm just actually watching the house. Um, 
I, I don't really have any comment on this time on the story. So. But they are your parents. Uh, yes. This is such a sad story and one that I'm going to be following to the very end because it is very reminiscent of the Turpin family case, of so many of these cases where these monster parents, I will never understand for the life of me, these monster parents who adopt and choose to foster and take in all of these children. Like, I get it. It's for a paycheck, clearly. It's not because they actually love these children. But there are so many other ways to make a paycheck. What I, it, I just, it's beyond my comprehension, honestly, because I feel like we talk about it so frequently. Parents who are foster parents then adopt only to lock them in a room, starve them, hurt them, torment them. It's horrific. It is absolutely horrific. And how there are not stricter guidelines and procedures in place to make sure that this is not happening inside the home when you clearly know that there is a motive and an incentive for these people to adopt and foster. So there should be extra checkpoints to make sure like, oh, you know what? They're fostering. They're adopting. It's because they want money. So there there's a reason behind it. Maybe they're not just loving parents. So we better continue to check on them. Like how there are not procedures in place is beyond me. I mean, and procedures that actually work. So their bond hearing will be held on June 26th and I will be watching, even though I seriously doubt that they will get bond. I truly believe that if the neighbor didn't take swift action and call the police when they did, then we would totally be telling a different story soon. Imagine if Krista was driving around the neighborhood and had found that little boy. Imagine the retaliation that he probably would have suffered. It could have been a very different outcome. And in my opinion, this neighbor saved his life and the lives of the others. And I'm curious why the set of twins and why Krista's biological child didn't suffer any of this sort of behavior and torment. Is it because they were her children and she just wanted the boys to suffer? She just wanted his biological children to suffer and then the boys? Like, it, it's not making sense to me why some were chosen and some were not. So if you have any thoughts or comments on that, please let me know in the comment section below. But like I said, I will be following this one very closely because I think we have barely began to scratch the surface of what has gone on inside those four walls of absolute horror. So I will keep you updated. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys, and until the next one, stay safe. Bye.